This is Dog Storian. Stories about dogs. And their people. And related species. Like cats. And this is me, Justina. And this is me, Brian. Oh. Oh my God, actually, I have a dog story for you. And it's about how my parents met. So my parents are together because my mom had a dog called Christy. She was interviewing for a job at a, oh, what is the word for this? I'm only thinking of the German word right now. There's Halfway house. Here. Ah, halfway house for the disabled and my dad was originally planning to go to med school so he was doing like a couple of years of working in the disabled Mm -hmm. community and apparently he was the manager the one who was responsible for interviewing her and she she sort of like wasn't taking the job too seriously and she brought her dog and she left the dog outside tied up outside of the this big old victorian house in lynn massachusetts which is right north of boston So I guess he said, come in, took her into the office and he gave her a piece of paper to read and like gave it to her like two, like two pieces of the the same paper. And she was like, okay, this guy, like, what is up with him? And she was just sort of like, this interview is going badly. Like, I think I should just leave. And she was, and then he had to go do something. And she was like, how long is this going to take? Cause my dog is outside. And he was like, your dog is outside. And she's like, yeah. And he's like, can we bring her in? (laughs) <laughs> and so she's like, sure. And so then they brought Christy in and my dad got down on the floor and was like petting and hugging this dog. And my mom's like, what is with this? This is the weirdest interview I've ever been on in my life. And my dad just really loved the dog. And I guess he thought my mom was pretty special because he offered her the job and she took it. And I think they kind of used the, or he used the dog as like a way to get into her heart. (laughs) And so that's the story of how they met. Yeah. And because she worked with these, all these um, sort of disabled young adults, like they love to have the dog there. So that the dog kind of became like a fixture of, of the, the facility. So that was our dear friend, Carly Audenbright. It's a pretty amazing story. I mean, I'm not surprised because dogs always make crazy things and, and bring people together. But it actually made me think of one phenomenon related to dog training or where dog training was the key. Which is? I won't spoil much, but today we'll hear from three ladies. And all of them worked on pretty badass projects involving dogs. Let's hear it. And we start with the first guest, whose name is Mina Sild. Our connection happened through Yoga with Adrian, Find What Feels Good community. And here I just come to find her profile, which said that you are the co-founder of Estonian Prison and Shelter Dogs Initiative. How did this happen? What is it? What is your story? Okay, amazing. Uh, I love it that you found it through a Yoga with Adrian because she also has a dog. And I don't think that a lot of yoga online trainers have a dog in their yoga, but she does. So it's uh, like a common theme. For the prison dog project, uh, it's actually interesting because I am myself not uh, by background uh, a dog trainer or anything related to that. And I've also never actually been to a prison before we started this project. My background is actually in uh, psychology and physiotherapy and mental health. But uh, one thing that's always been with me is that um, I'm very curious about human behavior, how it is impacted by different different um, subjects in our life and kind of our ability to change our behavior and also kind of our inner experience of being ourselves. In a dreamy way, I'm kind of a believer in human potential that uh, everybody can change and if if they are given the right circumstances, then then they will. And at the same time, uh, I believe a lot in um, doing effective things in a way that using resources uh, for the best. I've also worked in the government field in Estonia and I've seen how many uh, cool services we actually have for, you know, different people, different uh, groups. Two years ago, no, actually now already three years ago in spring, I saw one video on Facebook about um, the uh, prison dog projects uh, in the USA. This uh, immediately resonated with me and I thought that this is such a beautiful idea that you bring together two groups uh, that can actually help each other. So we don't need to, you know, build services or train special people, but but actually these two groups of alive beings uh, can actually support each other. 
And then I was just inspired by it. And then uh, I think it was a month later, there was a social innovation uh, kind of academy or incubator in Estonia. And they were looking for applicants. And then I told my uh, colleague that, hey, I saw this uh, video and I think that we should do something like this in Estonia. And she asked, like, okay, do you know something about uh, prisoners or dogs or shelter dogs? And I said, no, actually, I don't. <laughs> but I really believe that uh, this is an idea worth uh, exploring. And then we applied uh, to the incubator uh, and we were picked out uh, from 75 ideas to be one of the six ideas uh, that could participate in the incubator. We hadn't talked to any shelters or any prisons, but then uh, already one newspaper wrote an article about us that we are going to do this idea. And then I, I was thinking to myself that, oh boy, we haven't even talked to the prisons or the shelters yet, but now people are already writing. So it was kind of a crazy thing. Uh, if I knew that it's going to be so fast and full of unexpected things, then uh, I think maybe we should we would not have had the courage to really start with that. Yeah, I think uh, in this case, it's a nice saying that ignorance is bliss, that we actually didn't know of all the restrictions and about all the things that could go wrong. And we also didn't know how uh, many restrictions there are in the prison system. So we were kind of these, you know, blue eyed uh, four uh, ladies uh, in Estonia who said that we have an idea and we want to we want to make it happen. So what was your initial idea that you presented to both prisons and shelters? What was the aim of the initiative? The aim uh, was actually, we, we also drew a lot of parallels actually between uh, the dogs in the shelters and the, the people in the prisons. And we were very lucky already in very early stages. We met a really good um, dog trainer My name is Emma Jäger. Who, who trains, uh, who has her own training company for dogs and, and she only trains through positive reinforcement. When I heard about this program, I was uh, really, really keen about it. Yeah, it's interesting. Mina mentioned that uh, many shelters, when they heard about this, they were very skeptical. And uh, you were the only one who agreed to help her and to try it out. What did you think? Why did you decide to join? Working with reactive dogs, you know that aggressive and uh, violent behavior is just behavior. It is possible to figure things out with positive reinforcement uh, better than uh, when you use punitive methods. So this project seemed like it had uh, very many common grounds uh, with what I already knew about dogs and behavior. So I wanted to see how it would work out with people too. Our one big argument was that we can actually bring some kind of positive activity to the prisoners' lives. Uh, they will learn new skills and they will see how it is to change someone else's behavior through positive reinforcement. So actually they are kind of being punished in a prison with, you know, they are, their freedom is taken away from them. But at the same time, with the dogs, they can actually learn how to praise their good behavior. And that was like one powerful argument. And from the dog's perspective, there isn't a lot of possibility in the Estonian shelters to train the dogs because the shelters are operating on some uh, money from like the local municipalities and then also a bit from the sh charities. But there is not a lot of opportunity to train the dogs. And And then we decided to take the approach. In the project, we would try to have the dogs who are maybe a bit older, who are not, you know, the puppies are kind of always, they, they will find a new home, at least in, in Estonia. It's always like that from the shelters. But we wanted to show um, with the help of that dog trainer that it's actually possible to change the behavior also with the older dogs. So we tried to kind of, um, from the shelter's perspective, offer an opportunity just to have like, you know, voluntary people to come and train the dog and uh, with the guidance then of a professional dog trainer. 
Mm -hmm. So it seems that you had a pretty big screening of the dogs. What about the other side? What we asked from the, the prisons and also the Ministry of Justice, because by that time we were also in contact with the ministry, was that uh, we really want to get to know the applicants before who are interested in our program. We want to make it like a job interview for them to apply to the program. So it wouldn't be, you know, just uh, that the prison selects and says that you four people, you go to the program. Um, but it's more that already applying to the program would also already be like a um, thing that could uh, help them develop or grow uh, in a way. And then uh, I think for, for our first program uh, in uh, spring 2018, we had uh, 10 applicants for four spots. So the group is small. You know, if you put the four shelter dogs already on one field of grass, then you need to make sure that they all, all have their space. We interviewed all 10 of them and it was a really great experience because me as well, I had never really talked to people in prisons and we very fast, uh, we learned to get to know, you know, their kind of um, ways of being or, you know, some of them still try to influence us uh, to pick them and, and uh, to kind of um, understand uh, why they are interested, what their motivation really is to participate. So we were interviewed viewing them and of course uh, the prison did like the first screening as well they didn't have any uh, animal animal rights abuse exactly. on the record i guess exactly yeah so this was one one also this precondition that that we set and also we started working with um, i don't know the real correct term in english but i can explain we have in Estonia like closed prison and then open prison and open is the kind of type of a prison where the people already go to work or school during the daytime and then uh, but only with uh, special passes and only on like uh, specific uh, trajectories so they, they need to take that bus and by that uh, time and so on in the evening they go back to the prison uh, so we started working with this open prison because those uh, people in the prison could actually go to the shelter themselves. It was a bit uh, tricky to do it in the closed prison because that would mean that we need to take the dogs in the prison, which would be like uh, when you look at it uh, from a safety side, uh, then it would be a, a bit more trickier. How long did the program run? Uh, so we did it five times in, in two years' time. And one program, uh, the duration is uh, two months, is the active part of the program where the people and dogs uh, are meeting. And then, of course, there is like preparation part where we do the interviews and we choose the people. And we also choose the dogs in a way that uh, the shelter and uh, the dog trainer and one person from, from our team, we all together go to the shelter and we see the potential dogs. And we also assess their behavior. So we kind of worked out our own or developed our own uh, tool for that. We never took talks with biting history, for example, into our program because uh, the risks were too high that uh, amateur trainers might um, uh, stumble across something uh, weird otherwise. Most of the dogs were like uh, adolescent years they had smaller uh, behavior problems like jumping up and pulling on leashes and uh, such things what were the matching criteria uh, for us uh, usually our dog trainer in her head she usually already um, made some uh, kind of matches like who would be good pairs in the shelter when there was the first uh, training session then she kind of suggested who would be with whom. And usually in the end, it was they, these were really good matches. I think she had a really good instinct about it. When we were matching people to the dogs, with, we only did it after we had really met the people uh, in a group and the dogs. Uh, they had also met the dogs. Then we decided and uh, we usually match dogs to people uh, who would um, help uh, those people to open up 
for uh, calm down for example if uh, if we got a really impulsive uh, person then then we wanted to give him a talk that would uh, help him learn about uh, patience if we had a really um, introvertic person then then we wanted a really really happy happy talk so he would uh, have a chance to play with him and such this was really not uh, scientific uh, <laughs> choosing it was more more like uh, sensing uh, what would work out then. so basically some sort of opposite matching yeah but not always uh, sometimes uh, the opposites were too strong we try to look at it each individual and what it brings to the table and usually what was interesting was that the dogs could really teach that person who was training them something very valuable those who were really confident got like a challenging talk so that they could you know see that oh it's not so easy and what we also did during the program was that we did um, we changed the dogs for a few lessons so it was like the first uh, five six lessons they uh, got to train their own dog and they got to know the dog and had their first progress and then uh, during uh, seventh and eighth uh, lesson uh, they got now uh, a dog from somebody else and then they suddenly realized that oh boy, that some things that were so natural for me and my dog, they don't work with the other dog or maybe vice versa. They had a kind of challenging dog and then they saw that, okay, it's uh, I can actually handle this other dog, so there is hope. For dogs, it was uh, important to learn that Uh, different people do the same thing and uh, this is normal so the dogs got their generalization going and uh, for people it was really good uh, for them to see that uh, dogs are really different because uh, when they had this really calm dog for example and they had a uh, bliss walking around with him then it was a good experience when they saw that okay this is not my great training but <laughs> this dog is just calmer and uh, the o- opposite way around that w- when uh, we had a guy that uh, was working really hard to get uh, his dog to play with him and he didn't get it and then <laughs> then we uh, chose another dog for him that uh, was really pay- playful and he saw that oh oh, some dogs just play with me and other dogs don't. And after that, when he got back to his uh, original dog, he was much more self-confident in uh, working with this because he already knew that uh, it is not his bad. It is just the dog uh, who needs a different approach. And he did get this dog to play. So, What do you think was the biggest achievement in the program? for the dogs or for the people? Do you have, I don't know, like an exceptional pair or exceptional example which really stood out and is really in your memory still? There are so many things. <laughs> Maybe I was uh, the most surprised how eager to learn uh, these people were. They didn't come to the class to um, convey us that, uh, no, 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 my dog is really bad. They didn't ever uh, even think about Uh, hurting the dog, which was uh, maybe something that uh, people would think uh, prisoners would do. They were really, really patient and caring. And uh, I think uh, what played role was maybe that they came as a clean slate. They had never experienced training dogs before. But also, I think uh, they maybe felt um, empathetic with the dogs because they never wanted to take them into their cells again and uh, do such things. So it was really touching to see how well it suited. And and uh, the fact that mostly when they came into the project, they were really closed as persons. They didn't want to interact and they smiled uh, very um, seldomly and so and uh, after or in between the project you can see them lighten up 
and uh, become more confident, more playful and happy. So uh, it was really, really big thing to see. And uh, for the dogs also, you would be surprised how much dogs could learn in 10 weeks of uh, two times a week uh, training. Last project, they even developed verbal cues already. It was really fast and uh, really, really nice to see. So did you get to talk a lot to the people who participated in the program afterwards? What were their thoughts, their reflections on it? Some of them made comments, you know, that uh, oh, training dog, uh, tra- training this dog reminds me of uh, how I communicate with my kids. Or maybe I should, you know, also talk to my kids uh, more uh, in this uh, way to really notice their good behavior, but not punish their bad behavior. So they started making these uh, connections, uh, even sometimes to their relationships, sometimes uh, to their work lives. And then we decided that there is a lot of um, potential in uh, in actually taking the things that they experience with the dogs and, uh, and talking about it, how they can take it to their everyday life. So um, what we did was uh, we had this uh, one hour talking circle in the prison uh, once a week with them. And there we talked about um, their development and growth in the program, uh, what they think about it, uh, also um, non-violent communication, uh, mindfulness, uh, setting goals and uh, life after they uh, are released from the prison. So we talked about uh, all kinds of different things. So we got a lot of their uh, very raw and uh, authentic impressions from there. And then also after the program ended, then we always did a follow-up interview with them. And these were really interesting uh, because I think for me, the kind of most important or what I uh, resonated uh, so much with with, uh, was when uh, a few of the participants, and we had 22 people uh, participate in those five uh, programs. One of the most beautiful things that was said was actually that this was the first time when they felt that they could make a positive impact in somebody else's lives. So they were used to thinking about themselves as kind of being having not so positive impact because they you know had some trouble in their lives Uh, they were you know not obeying the law and they had done something that they are now in prison and they were they had kind of a self uh, image that they tend to hurt people and um, those living beings around them more than really you know having a good impact but now with a dog they really saw that wow I can actually learn new skills I can train the dog and then the dog will find a new home. So this is kind of, you know, my positive uh, impact. And this was this was really powerful. Mm. And then in addition to that, uh, they also said that um, they really enjoyed uh, just going to the shelter and communicating with people who are not um, prison staff. Because we always, you know, it's, it's easier for us. We didn't have any role with those people. For us, they were just people. So we were not, you know, kind of in charge of anything uh, re- regarding their behavior. But, um, but we were just communicating with them as regular people. And they said that they really enjoyed it, uh, that they could, uh, you know, be more free and, and have this experience, how it is to be around uh, kind of positive uh, mindset. Because we always encouraged them and, you know, showed them their positive, uh, stronger sides and so on. Also, they brought out uh, confidence that uh, they could learn new skills. Also, kind of uh, persistence that they saw that even if it's really difficult, it's worthwhile. Because the dogs, in the end, after two months of, you know, persistent training, the dogs still learned uh, new tricks and, and they changed their behavior. So some of the participants said that they now realize that they have been lacking this persistence in their own life. And maybe that's what brought them to this criminal path that when they because some of them were already in the prison for, you know, two, three, four times. And they said that when they get out of the prison and they go back to their lives, then they don't have the patience, actually, to wait for that life to really get going. So it's easier for them sometimes to, you know, commit a new crime, like uh, stealing something or, you know, starting to sell drugs. And it's it's kind of easier way for them. And they are not patient enough for, for to wait uh, to get a proper job and to get a proper income and so on. 
the people who participated in the program, do they still have any contact with the dogs? Maybe some of them were adopted by them or what was the destiny? There were people who actually wanted to adopt uh, the dog uh, who they trained. To my knowledge, uh, none of them did. I think in a way it's actually quite um, reasonable of them if they have been in prison for some time and they get out, like not to do very like these uh, rushing decisions about, uh, especially when it influences another living being's life. Uh, so, so I think it was a good call that uh, in that moment that they didn't adopt. I know that uh, some of them continue to go to the shelter do like a little bit like a voluntary work in the shelters and some of them actually had dogs at home I think that the, the best impact uh, was that many of them said in the final interviews that now I go home and I train my dog totally differently that now I know about this positive reinforcement and now I don't think anymore you know that when my dog uh, eats uh, my sausages that are on the table then I don't then I understand that it's not my dog's problem that my dog is not supposed to understand that you you're not supposed to do it but it's my problem to really teach the dog that uh, this is not for you and be patient like if you want something so so it, I think it's I, I would really be eager to see how they are doing with their own dogs but uh, right now we uh, what we are doing um, are like follow-up calls uh, uh, six months after they have been released uh, from the prison to really ask like what do you remember from the paw and hand program and how has it influenced you some of them said that uh, it's actually the best thing that they remember from uh, the time that they were in prison like it was the positive experience one of them <laughs> said a really uh, funny thing as well uh, that he had also been in prison in Norway he had this experience from Norwegian prisons uh, that he was treated in such a good way in the prison that he decided that he could never do something uh, against the law in Norway because they were so kind to him in the prison you know they knock on the door when they come in and it's it's a different system than the hours he had the same experience with our pro project that he was treated so well in the project that he felt after that and, and he had been in prison like several times already committing the kind of same crime um, to make a living and then he said that that now he feels that he cannot do it to the Estonian society anymore because he has been treated so so well and it was like a real like a wow uh, experience for us as well to hear something like that and uh, really made us believe that it's possible actually you know that if you don't punish like it's the same with dogs if you don't punish if you really show them how you can learn something new through positive uh, behavior then it's uh, much more likely that they will actually change their behavior if you punish then it only creates uh, fear and, uh, and distance why do you think it's it's this way why is positive reinforcement working better because there are still so many voices saying that why not you know we need to punish dogs and that's more much more effective the results are much faster I'm not sure they are faster. They seem faster. I really don't have experience in a punitive uh, training method, so I'm not the right person to compare the two. But uh, I can say that uh, with my own experience with uh, positive reinforcement, it has been really, really shockingly fast and effective for me. And when I took uh, that shelter dog of mine he was a really big dog big male dog when he was growling at me and uh looking really really scary i didn't think i could take him on physically <laughs> you know <laughs> so so i knew right away that i need to learn more and uh, find another way i think it is faster and i think it is also um safer safer for for both sides i guess for people and also yeah. for the dogs yeah i think it is some sometimes maybe not talk about uh, how it is uh, safer for people as well because when you work with uh, violent dogs uh, who might uh, really hurt people then you really want to do everything that uh, you can so that uh, the dog doesn't hurt people and uh, if you do it uh, with positive reinforcement it is safer. This is probably the main reason I do this. Uh, I find it uh, safer to introduce to people who are really far away from dog training communities. You mentioned this, uh, this I've never heard this 
concept, though it makes perfect sense, you mentioned this concept of generalization. How do you prepare a dog for to teach them that human beings can be consistent, particularly with regard to training, but also prepare them to deal with the fact that human beings are inconsistent <laughs> and unpredictable. <laughs> Do you have any tips about that? Yeah. And if you have any tips for humans too, you know, we also struggle with this. <laughs> I'm still learning about humans. It is so way harder. <laughs> but with dogs, I actually train for unexpected. For example, at the moment I'm working on a sound sen sensitivity on one of my dogs. At one point when I'm training, I will add a um, surprise effect for it. So I will um, act as if I'm uh, not uh, thinking about uh, training at all. Maybe washing dishes. They would think it would be weird uh, because I would never wash dishes. But <laughs> but uh, I will do something that uh, is really, really normal uh, human behavior and then still do the treat party for the sound and uh, they will learn that okay even under these conditions it might seem so dogs are really smart they figure it out if we mostly reward them for the behavior and if, if we mostly remember to reward them even even if, if we didn't mean it even if it was really an accident for example you left the door open and the dogs bolted out and they came back when you called uh, in a really uh, distressed manner then uh, when you then go to the fridge and still get, get them something then uh, then they remember it and uh, they think that okay this was also the same game that we have always played are you sitting in your car right now yeah i'm sitting in my car i <laughs> There's a reason for that. Why are you sitting in your car? <laughs> well, I have a six-month-old baby in inside my home, and I have two really ambitious uh, Siberian huskies. So I'm sitting in the car so that you wouldn't hear them. <laughs> I wanted to thank Evian for this so much. <laughs> this is so considerate. <laughs> That's very smart. <laughs> Very nice acoustics yeah. in your car. Yeah. Plus, I like the trees in the background. So how are the dogs getting along with the baby? Uh, they seem to be nice about it. <laughs> they don't. They they are not really thrilled about the hair pulling, <laughs> hair pulling and <laughs> such things. So, but I make uh, things safe for each party, and uh, I'm I always tend to be the little bit too careful uh, dog owner so I don't uh, leave them unattended and uh, I am always carefully watching and uh, making sure that the uh, dogs feel self safe and the baby will feel safe and everything is safe because I really don't want any bites or fights in my family. Absolutely. I remember my sister was born, she's my younger sister, and uh, we had the Rottweiler still, and he was uh, around six, seven years old, and he helped her to start walking. She would just try to climb a little bit slowly, slowly, <laughs> and eventually they just took off and <laughs> walked together. Wow, <laughs> that's a really special thing. My Siberians would never have the patience. I was wondering, I actually tried to remember it myself today, since we met through yoga community. Do you remember your first downward facing dog? Or who taught you it? <laughs> oh, such a good question. I think it, it must have been in university, because I think that was the first time when I was like 19 or so that I went to a yoga class. But then I remember actually my first yoga class, it was power yoga. And I didn't understand anything about what she was saying because it was so fast. And I was just like, you know, trying to stay alive with all the position uh, changes. And, and I think it was like maybe six, seven years after that when I went to like a real proper beginner's course in yoga to understand the fundamentals and the basics of the, the downward and, and upward facing dogs. <laughs> Yeah, but I love to actually see um, when I uh, after I started doing yoga more deeply, and then now, like even now being in the shelter more, 
uh, I love to see the dogs actually doing the positions. It's really cool. And you see that they actually do it. So it's not like, you know, something uh, made up, uh, but it's really uh, like the downward and upward. They, they really do it uh, when they want to stretch themselves. So I'm, I'm really uh, inspired uh, by the dogs and, um, and by their kind of sincerity. I've always had a, a dream that if I could be that person who greets their you know, loved ones as eagerly as, as the, the dogs always greet us, you know, they are never in a bad mood or, uh, you know, they, they don't go like, I mean, if, if you come home, then they always kind of run to you and they are so happy to see you. So it's like kind of my life goal to, to have that uh, behavior of a dog to my loved ones. <laughs> After the conversation with Mina and Emma, we definitely wanted to know more about these programs, especially about the scientific side, the research side of them. So we spoke with Dr. Barbara Cook. I am an assistant professor of criminal justice at Texas A&M University, Kingsville. Whom we asked about the origins of these programs and spoke about many, many things related to it. They started in 1981 by a nun who was Sister Pauline Quinn. And unfortunately, she actually just died uh, earlier this year. But she started the very first dog training program at a correctional facility in Washington State, a women's correctional facility. And that's important because most correctional programs are actually designed around male inmates. It makes sense. Most inmates are male, the vast majority. So a lot of programming is developed for men. And this was actually unique because it was a program developed in a women's prison but is obviously widely used in men's program in men's correctional facilities as well and throughout the 80s you particularly in Washington and Oregon and then on the East Coast you started to see more and more correctional facilities start to implement them Pauline Quinn sister sister Pauline Quinn she actually was more of just an animal lover and she happened to also work in the prisons and then kind of just had this idea that's kind of how that started and it became very popular in the 90s and then puppies behind bars which is a program that's mostly in New York and uh, Massachusetts and kind of New England, started to get some recognition from Oprah. They published a really beautiful coffee table book. (laughs) They started to get a little bit more notoriety in the news. And that started to kind of, I think, pique people's interest because then, because I've actually kind of charted Uh, because I, I keep a record of every program I come across and I try to look at what date it started, if it ended or anything like that. And you can just see in the early 2000s, it just kind of, there was a huge explosion. And then again, there was kind of another explosion in them of around 2013, 14. Again, there's another big boom. So now my number that I've been cl- um, counting is at about 390 correctional facilities in the United States alone. So I think there's a few reasons why they're very popular in the United States. One, Americans love dogs, they really do. We have, unlike a lot of European countries, we have a lot of animal shelters, a lot of stray dogs, a lot of dogs who are needlessly euthanized. A lot of the dog training programs in the United States use dogs who are quote unquote on death row, dogs who are deemed unadoptable. So the idea is that you're training them to get uh, the American Kennel Club canine good citizenship test, they pass that. They, they, a lot of them train it to pass that. If they have any behavioral issues, for example, there are some programs that specialize in taking like, pit bulls, for example, who were part of dog fighting rings and rehabilitating them. Uh, basically making them adoptable. So those programs, that's, that's the vast majority of them in the United States. So there's a huge need for it, and I think that's one of the reasons why it works, uh, it's so popular in the United States in that regard. It's also really good image for the prison, fulfills needs. Uh, service animals are extremely expensive to be privately trained, so this cuts the cost down dramatically. And you do see them pop up around the world, uh, as I mentioned. You know, in Canada, there's a lot in Canada. C- Canada is very similar in the United States in that regard. There are still a lot of animal shelters, dogs are needlessly euthanized. I'm not as familiar with Australia. I do notice that there are a lot of Australian programs, but I... From my experience in Europe, obviously depends on the country, but in a lot of Western Europe in particular, there's not as many just stray dogs roaming the streets. Not as many compared to the United States where I can drive around. I live out in the countryside in Texas and there's just dogs galore and nobody does anything about it and our shelters are full and basically if you take a dog to the animal shelter here, it's gonna be euthanized. 
a lot of prisons have a lot of freedom and leeway to do what they want, what whatever kind of programs they can bring in. And since dog training programs seem to be free or virtually free, that is very appealing to certain prisons. So if somebody brings and say, hey, I want to bring in this program, it's not going to cost you a dime. Research suggests it's actually going to be very beneficial across the board. They, they have the, the wardens have the, generally speaking, have the freedom to do that. Other countries where there might be a little more red tape around it, it might be more difficult, especially if you're trying to bring in dogs that could be a lawsuit <laughs> or could be deemed uh, unsanitary or anything like that. So I think there's just a little bit more leeway in the United States compared to some other countries. So what is your experience? What really changes in the prison environment once such a program is introduced? Because I can imagine that it's a huge shift when you consider how little exposure prisoners have to anything from external life. So I'll start at the macro level. Let's just look at the prison itself. So my research suggests, and this is primarily qualitative research at the mo uh, where this is from. We've, we've kind of been brainstorming ways to quantify it, to really truly measure it. But So at the prison level, you have inmates, you have prison staff members, you have prison wardens, lieutenants, etc., who have all reported that since the dog program was started at their facility, there's been an increased feeling of security in term because there tends to be less tension, more laughter, general positive atmosphere, just having the dogs at the facility. There are always going to be people who don't like dogs, who are going to complain about it, who might try to get the program stopped. But generally speaking, they say especially if the dogs are socializing with people on the prison grounds, they just say that you notice a lot less problem behavior. There's also been some reported there are some elements, sometimes bullying of people who are in the program by certain inmates who might tease them because they have to pick up dog poop or something like that. The inmates tend to shrug that off and say, well, I get to hang out with a dog all day and what do you get to do? <laughs> so down to the micro level, we see several different types of changes. We see improved self-esteem, improved emotional intelligence and just general mental health. We see improved relationships between people. We see improved behavior among inmates on the prison grounds, less behavioral infractions, less reprimands. We see less fighting. We, we, our research does suggest that we see reduced reoffending once released. So we see across the board a whole lot of different elements. And some of the some of the things too that are different between men and women in terms of outcomes, everything I just said kind of applies across the board, but there seems to be even a more some even more unique outcomes related to female offenders in the programs. We see female offenders who have who are parents. So about depending on where where you're looking at, about 70% of women inmates uh, a mother are mothers and most of them were primary caregivers once they were incarcerated. So there's a lot of loss associated with that status as mother. I mean, obviously they're still a mother, but they don't, they're not a caretaker of their children anymore. So taking care of the dogs, a lot of them report that there's just, uh, it helps heal that wound, that pain of imprisonment, if you will. About 75% of all uh, female inmates are victims of uh, some sort of uh, abuse whether it's mental, physical, or sexual. And actually the same percentage, which is related, are also came into prison with a history of substance misuse or abuse as well. So they also report that a lot of them help them with their, uh, help them with their recovery, both with the mental health component and with the substance component as well. And I hear that from the staff as well. They say that we noticed that the women who are in the dog training program seem to be progressing through their other programs, whether it through mental health counseling and treatment, through substance abuse treatment, they seem to be doing better than their counterparts who are not in the program as well. So we see lots of lots of benefits. Yeah, and I'm really wondering, it seems like a magic cure almost. What what is so special then about these programs? How do they actually compare then in the global scale of rehabilitation programs? Are the others also as effective? This is what we're really trying to figure out because actually researching dog training programs, despite the fact that there's so many of them, is a little bit more complicated. We can't do a lot of the gold standard randomized control trial evaluations of them. It's just not feasible for lots of different reasons. One being another thing, there might just be something about dog people that makes them qualitatively different than other people. 
we might be getting in certain programs the cream of the crop because in some programs you can't be in the dog training program unless you are a property or drug offender but then another program will let in people who are there for second degree murder and who have long rap sheets so it just depends that makes it difficult to compare other research hasn't found necessarily the same strength of outcomes as well so it's it's, again it depends so much on the program that you are evaluating what the criteria are if you are evaluating the outcomes of the cream of the crop of your prison you'd expect them to have better outcomes than the general population in your prison so i prefer actually in that regard to include programs and research programs that do let in people who are murderers and in for violent offenses and who are not your model uh, inmates. I love that I get to do so many interviews because I wouldn't necessarily have found this this fun fact (laughs) out, but everybody seems to say that it helps with self-control because if you get in trouble, a lot of programs immediately kick you out of the program. And they also point out that if you're training a dog, Your leash is like a conduit, right? If you have negative emotions, it's gonna go right down your leash and your dog's going to start misbehaving and not listening to you. So you have to remain calm, cool, and collected when you're training in order to get your dog to comply. So between those two things, every single inmate that I have spoken to, interviewed, has said that it's helped improve their self-control. And I think that is a key component. That's probably the magic behind all of it because that's everybody could use better self-control whether you're in prison or not right and it definitely helps if if your offenses are related to your own impulsivity right so and that's the biggest risk factor we know for reoffending as well is self-control or impulsivity i tend to think of it yeah that i think it can be i don't want to i would never say a magic pill but it could be (laughs) in sense something that it's so inexpensive to implement not everybody wants to be in a dog training program. Not everybody wants to be training dogs. It is very difficult to do. There's a lot of benefits associated with it, but it to me, it's one of those things that I think every prison should have, frankly. That's what my research suggests. I'm also a dog person, so obviously there's a little bit of bias there. In that meta-analysis, we compared our findings to findings of uh, other very popular prison programs like the risk needs responsivity model we found that yeah we seem to have stronger effects and because those programs tend to be so expensive the cost benefit uh analysis suggested that for the risk needs responsivity model it's like for every dollar you spend you save two which is great that's phenomenal right you're making your money back (laughs) and then some because dog training programs are so inexpensive we found we and we broke it down. We took out murder sometimes. We but we found that you saved, you know, hundreds to sometimes even thousands of dollars if you include murder, because murder is very expensive cost to society and, and the criminal justice system. So, yeah, but it's really incredible. The, the the dogs not only are saved, but they are also trained, and they are becoming really good examples for you know everybody around you. I was wondering, is there any stigma associated with the dogs who are trained in prisons? when people get to adopt them or if they are the service dogs and become a companion to a person or there's basically no difference or maybe even a certain pride that my dog was trained in prison. Do you follow up on these dogs who get adopted eventually? That is a really wonderful question. I This is completely based on what I see in social media. I follow a lot of different dog training programs who have a social media presence. And they always post the success stories, you know, the dog with the new family. And that definitely seems to be very more towards the prideful side of things. I'm sure there might be some people who don't tell everybody that their dog was adopted in prison. A lot of actually, a lot of programs say that their number one adopter are the prison staff, actually. (laughs) That they adopt more out (laughs) of their prison staff than anybody else. Um, That's sometimes that's sometimes the case it kind of sometimes also seems to depend on the shelter the dogs are coming from if it's a shelter uh type of program you know i I had thinking one in particular one in uh paws on pearl out of gainesville and they're the animal shelter that they partner with is extremely active adopts a lot of dogs out to begin with brings dogs onto you know the morning news whether they were in the program or not (laughs) but they're very very active and they have wait lists for dogs to adopt them sometimes, to adopt them out. I mean, it's amazing. So there's a lot of people who just are very excited to have adopted a dog. Which, which, pause one second. 
No worries. <laughs> so this is Pinto. <laughs> Pinto came from the Hello. dog training program <laughs> in oh. Texas. You are serious? <laughs> <laughs> yep. So he, <laughs> this is this is my dog Pinto. He's a rat terrier mix, and he came from a juvenile detention facility in Brownsville, Texas, and the program is called Pause, pairing achievement with success. And I adopted him when I, shortly after I moved to Texas, and uh, he's amazing. It was wonderful. It was amazing to uh, to adopt a dog that was fully trained, <laughs> as he was. I can and, imagine. <laughs> and it was just super sweet. So um, I actually adopted one, and I'm very proud full of it. <laughs> uh, very proud of it. And uh, actually, my, my university that I work at did a whole. They have like a magazine that they put out and they did a whole article piece and he was a cover dog and everything on it so yeah he well, was that is snapping, definitely a case so of success <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> so I'm very proud of it and actually he got the name Pinto from my colleague because it is uh, Mexican slang for having spent time in prison I thought that I heard that this somewhere in Money Heist or <laughs> in one of the TV shows so that's what my my uh, colleague started, uh, Dr. Rodriguez started calling him that, and the name just stuck, the nickname stuck. So that's what he goes by. So what did he learn? What did he learn? And what do the other dogs learn in the prison? So this is that's actually a really neat, uh, really neat program. So he was just trained to pass the canine good citizenship test. And oh, I did go through that with him too, and, and he got the certificate and everything. He even, we went through training to be therapy, a therapy dog team, <laughs> and he did not pass that uh, only because he was scared of the building that they tested in because we were there during a storm and he gets afraid of thunder and it just associated and we could never even go back to train there so it was really sad so he didn't pass that so uh but they they, they trained him all all kinds of neat things like they he passed he did the base all the basic commands so you know sit stay heal all of that sort of thing but then they also trained him some some really unique uh things like he he'll if you go bang he rolls over and <laughs> and does that kind of stuff so it's, it's me and i unfortunately did not get to meet the girl who trained him that's something that was really sad i picked him up on a holiday weekend on a sunday and they wouldn't let me in the facility to meet her so normally they do try to do that so i i didn't even get to learn from her all of the tricks that she taught him some of the things I, I discovered that he could do, like shake and high five and um, a back, like almost like a backflip, were completely happenstance. I made a I made a gesture with my hand and he did something. <laughs> so I was like, oh, okay. And uh, do you also follow, I guess, uh, the people who get out afterwards? What are the memorable cases, maybe, from your experience? I personally haven't followed many, um, partly because I'm they have to request my contact i can give like i can give i give my contact information to the prison but it's a policy that i can't get in touch with them they have to get in touch with me i have had a few a, a, a couple of people write me from prison and we've maintained pen pals and there's actually one right now that i'm waiting to hear back from him because he just got released and it's the same policy for the prisons the prison staff members the programs everything the inmate has to stay in touch with you so how we monitor recidivism is using uh, department of corrections data you know they have id numbers and everything like that so they can see how this has this person being rearrested that's how they do that so i can't even do that they have to i have to, I have to work with the department of corrections but there are a lot of programs that do have people who stay around. They've, there have been people who have volunteered with the program afterwards, particularly, you know, generally with the animal shelter that they're working with, because I obviously can't volunteer in the prison. <laughs> but they can they can work at the animal shelter. A lot have used the connections that they made from with people who volunteer with the programs to get jobs on the outside. Several have gone on to get certified to be vet techs, to be dog groomers, to run kennels, that sort of thing. A lot of them do end up working with animals. I wouldn't say a, not the majority, but there's a percentage um, that do. But the ones that always stick with my mind are the people who were able to go get certified to be a vet tech or something like that. Or um, I know a couple of cases uh, in Texas, there are people, part of the program involved them volunteering with a food bank as well. They got jobs with the food bank after they were released so they continued that altruistic work which i think is really interesting as well and a lot of them focus on fostering the the good social skills 
and the professional social skills. How do you talk to people you know, that aren't your friends in a professional environment? How do you present yourself? How do you write a resume? This actually kind of goes back to people who adopt from these programs. One of the neat things that a lot of them do, we'll have like a graduate, they'll have a graduation ceremony for the dogs and invite the new adoptees to come and watch. And a lot of times they'll have one of the trainers give like a, a commencement speech, if you will. And I got to go to one of these, actually it was really cool. One of the neatest experiences in my research, I got to actually attend one of these events. Each of the adoptive families met with the inmate who trained their dog and they went through all the, you know, all the skills, they demonstrated everything, and then they got to meet the person that, that was adopting their dog. And that's super powerful as well. So, and then again, part of that is, they, and they'll say, one of the reasons we do that, well, two reasons. One, it's, you know, everyone wants to know where they're, somebody that their, their dog is going, right? Because one of the hardest parts of being in this program is saying goodbye to the dogs, of course. But the second side of it is we are teaching you how to uh, pro-socially interact with society and present yourself well and foster public speaking skills and foster that networking skill. So, How did you become a dog person? <laughs> Was it always in your family? A running tradition of dog love? or oh, Always. Yeah? Do you remember your first dog? My parents had, when I was born, they had, I think, three dogs, two schnauzers and a mix. <laughs> so I grew up with them and I always, I'm an only child. I always called them my brothers and sisters. You know, I was raised by dogs. <laughs> so, and they were always very a active with local SPCAs, like the various animal shelters and animal societies in the area. Um, very big in animal rescue. So the first dog that was actually my dog was a Lhasa Apsu named Wally that we, that we, um, rescued well sort of rescued um there was a a couple who was told it was a shih tzu and then it kept growing and growing and growing and they lived in a retirement home so i used to play with the dog at the retirement home so they asked if we wanted to adopt him so we did well thank you so much barbara it was lovely talking to you thank you so much for having me it was wonderful and i'm glad i'm glad we got we got to I gotta say, I did love all those stories. It, mm. it kind of restores my faith in humanity. Your dog manity. <laughs> yeah, dogs make everything better. I'm kind of wondering, you know, do dogs ever feel ashamed of us? I don't know. I don't want to make any non-scientific conclusions, even though that's fun. But based on the way they sort of run away or try to <laughs> <laughs> flee the scene the second they poo, <laughs> not to bring up an indelicate topic... I don't know if it's they're ashamed to just have the good sense to flee their own feces and <laughs> really wonder why the heck we linger over the thing that I just got rid of. Yeah, it doesn't make it easier to collect it, does it? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe they'll tell someday. Well, this episode is like a real episode full of people in the credits. <laughs> you mean more than one? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. So. yes, so we would like to extend our heartfelt thanks to Barbara Cook. Emma Yeager. Carly Ottenbright. And Mina Silb. Now I have a special announcement. <laughs> I kind of enjoy saying this. <laughs> the next episode is going to be the last in the season. Yay! Yes! And it is rather special. Naturally. <laughs> so it is another live interview, which we were very fortunate to do during the summer of 2020 when COVID rules got relaxed. Briefly. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And Not to give away maybe too much, but... It was an epic experience and made for an episode we've been very excited to, to, to play work for on. You. Yeah. yeah. Some stories and sounds uh, might even raise your hair. See you next time.